Fly me to the moon Let me play up there with those stars Let me see what life is like on Jupiter and Mars In other words, home Ah, uh, that's a great one. Old Blue Eyes himself, Frank Sinatra, chairman of the board. What a guy, man. What a guy. What a voice. And he had a great comedian working with him all those years, and we're fortunate to have him here with us tonight. His name is Tom Dreesen. He's got a lot of stories, and I just can't wait. Tom Dreesen, coming up. You are all I long for, all I worship and do adore. Tom, how you doing, my man? I'm doing fine, Frankie. Who's that voice behind you? Is that you singing? That's uh, that's a great one. That's Frank Sinatra. That's not me. I can't sing for crap. <laughs> that's the real Frank. <laughs> I say you uh, you grew up in Harvey, Illinois, in South Chicago. We're on the south side of Chicago, yeah. It's 147 south of of the Loop, yeah. Yeah, I loved it out there. I worked out there a few times. I really loved that town, man. But, you know, of course, I'm prejudiced, but it, to me, Chicago, and I live in L.A. now, you know, but Chicago's the best city in America. That's just my opinion. It's the best walking city in America. It's got great uh, architecture, the Frank Lloyd Wright influences right. along the lake. It's, it's um, for culture, for art, the Art Institute, for sports, two major league baseball teams, great sports town, restaurants that uh, can compete with anybody. But the bottom line, Frankie, are the people. And and uh, they're just friendly Midwestern people. And, and Sinatra, all the years I toured with Frank, we work Chicago every year. For 14 years, and he always said, he said, people think that I work New York more than any other city. Truth is, he said, I work Chicago in my earlier career, and even now, and he had two songs about Chicago, you know, my kind of town right, in Chicago, right, right. as well as, you know, Chicago, Chicago, that toddling town, you know, so it's, it's just a great city. I enjoyed it. I, I was there for two weeks. I was doing a place called The Funny Firm, I believe it was. A guy named Len owned that, didn't he? Lenny, um... Mm -hmm. I don't know who it was. I just yeah. got, they, you know, after I did Saturday Night Live, they called me right away and flew me out there. And I, they said, you'll stay two weeks, right? I said, uh, 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 yeah, sure. You know, yeah, sure, sure. And I enjoyed it. I, I went to some of the clubs there. The food was, was excellent. It was summertime by the lake and those bridges that are crossing those little rivers that are going into the lake. That aqua green water was just gorgeous. Yeah, when, especially when you, go, when you go there during St. Patrick's Day, they fill that. Yeah. The, the river is all green. There. Yeah, and some of those guys fall in, too. Yeah. <laughs> Big, biggest laugh in Vegas years ago, and they, they quoted the line. They put it all across the wire system. Uh, I, when I went on stage, it was St. Patrick's Day in Los Angeles. I mean, in um, Las Vegas. And uh, I went on at the MGM Grand, and I walked out, and I said, what a, what a day, St. Patrick's Day, and everybody cheering. I said, there's 100,000 Irish in the city of Las Vegas today, and now they're all cheering. I said, it's the first time in the history of Las Vegas they comp your gambling, but you got to pay for your drinks. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> so you worked as an insurance man. You started in 1968 uh, working as an insurance man. How would you get, then you went into the Marines? No, before that, that I, I, before you got it in a little bit in reverse. Okay, I'm sorry. I had eight brothers and sisters. We lived wow. in a shack. Five eight? of us slept in one bed. Oh, my God. No bathtub and no shower and no hot water. And it wasn't during the Depression. I'm not that old. It was a rat-infested, rat roach-infested shack. Oh, boy. Holes in my shoes as big as a coffee cup. My whole childhood. I shined shoes in taverns. I set pins in bowling alleys. I caddied in the summertime. And I uh, sold newspapers on the corner. And I had a paper out all to help feed my brothers and sisters. I dropped out of high school at 16 and worked in the bowling alleys late. At age 17, the day I turned 17, I went into service in the Navy. I spent four years in the Navy, but I served nine months in the Marine Corps unit called NAGDF, Naval Emergency Ground Defense Force. I was trained by the Marine Corps up in Quonset Point. And um, after I came out of the service, I, want, I, was, I got married, I had kids, and I had three kids come one, two, three. I, um, I, I work construction, I wheel concrete, I, I, I was a bartender, I was a private detective. You know, I was uh, <laughs> uh, I worked for a photographer, my brother. Oh, you know. my God. Um, I just wandered from one job to another. I worked on a loading dock. I was a teamster. I loaded trucks. Then I dropped my card, and I became a foreman. So I was, I was back and forth with, with that. And um, then one day, a friend of mine talked me into selling life insurance. I was very active in a civic group called the JCs, at that time called the Junior Chamber of Commerce. So I knew a lot of people in the community. I was very active, active in, uh, in trying to in community service, you know. 
And because I had, knew a lot of people, my friend said, you'd make a good insurance salesman. You've already got a nest build of friends. So I started selling life insurance. And in one year, you know, I, so I was a member of the Million Dollar Roundtable. I placed over a million dollars for the life insurance in one year. And the next year I quit and I went into show business. And the, the president of the company flew in from Ohio. The company was called Columbus Mutual. Uh, out of Ohio, and the president flew in, and he said, "Have you lost your mind?" <laughs> what, what caught your eye, though? What caught your eye and said, "Hey, listen, I I like that guy on stage. I want to do that." I mean, how did how did that? Come? Well, what happened was I wrote a drug education program teaching grade school children the ills of drug abuse with humor. Mm. Run it as a JC project. Right, right. I said, well, that's what we did. The JCs did things within the community. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were men eighteen to thirty-eight, and they did things within the community to better the community. But in doing so, it gave you leadership programming, uh, training. You know, I, I learned how to serve on a committee, how to be a committee chairman. You know, I learned how to get up in front of an audience and all these kind of things that they train you to be a leader. In the process, when I wrote this drug education program, a young black man joined the chapter. He was graduated from Norfolk State College in, in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, and E.I. DuPont recruited him into Chicago as a marketing representative, and he joined the JCs. And he heard me pitching this project to the general membership. And he said, gee, I'd like to help you with that. I want to work with you. And I already had a guy, Frankie. But to show you the way fate is, the next day, the guy that was supposed to help me on that project got a new job, and he couldn't help me. And I said, gee, what was that black guy's name? Oh, yeah, Tim Reed. Tim Reed, wow. Tim so I Reed. said, hey, Tim, um, I went to him, and I said, would you like to work with me? He, he said, sure. We went in the, in the grade schools, and the program became number one in 50 states and in 22 foreign countries. Through their publications, they as a model program on how to teach drug education at an elementary school level. And one day a little eighth grade girl said, boy, are you guys funny, because we were always playing off of one another. Right, right. That's just so funny. You ought to become a comedy team. And the thought of a black-white comedy team intrigued us. No one had ever done that before. Yeah. They're writing what we thought was material. And there was no comedy clubs in those days, none. So there was one in New York, the improvisation, but it was we didn't pay. In those days, they had a singer and a comic. and a singer. But here in Chicago, we started trying to find a place that we went up one night on stage and we bombed. And, uh, and we, we, we were going so fast through our material that we bombed. And the next night, the owner said, come on and try it again. And that night, we got huge laughs. And that moment, that when I, there was a joke in that act that I had written that when it got a big laugh when I delivered it, it was almost like an epiphany. I said, wow, this is what I want to do. This is what I've been searching right. for my right. whole life. I, I couldn't sleep the whole night. I got up the next morning, I went to church, there was no service, it was a Saturday morning, and I mean, I prayed, I, I'm being honest, I said, God, if you let me make my living as a comedian, I'll never ask for anything else. The, the thought that one could make a living making people laugh totally overwhelmed me, and I knew that I would do this the rest of my life if I never made a dime, it's what I wanted to do. So you had a comedy team with Tim Reed in the first biracial team. And uh, that went on for a while, and then you guys broke up, I believe, right? And you started. Years. Then you recorded your own first album. When the team broke up and I went alone, uh, I did another album in front of an all-black audience called That White Boy Is Crazy. It was the first album where, uh, the first time a white guy ever appeared in front of an all-black audience in comedy. I just want, I like to do things that no one ever has done before, you know. Right, and then how was your meeting with Frank? How did that all come about? Did someone see you and say, I hey. I struggled for a year out yeah. here in the West Coast, you yeah. know, after the team broke up. I ended up on my rear end. My wife and three kids were in Chicago. My wife wrote me a Dear John letter. And on my, I, mean, oh, I finally got her back, but, and then we later got divorced. But yeah. I ended up sleeping in an old abandoned car, a Nash Rambler, where the front seat came down. It was up on blocks. It was, and, and that's another long story how I got there. But I hitchhiked every night to the comedy store, begging to work for free. And I, after I got on as a regular at the comedy store, about a year later, I kept bugging the Tonight Show to come and see me. And one night they came to see me, and my whole life changed. I, I got bumped three times. Each time I went there, I got bumped. But then I finally got on, and that night, it was the hottest night, the hottest crowd. I got 11 applause, and the curtain, and Johnny called me back out for a second bow. And the next day, my whole life changed. Sammy Davis, uh, William Moore signed me, uh, 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 CBS signed me to a development deal. A guy from CBS had been watching the show that night, mm. Lee Curlin. Um, and then Sammy Davis took me on the road with him for three years. And uh, so but one night after working with Sammy for years, I was working with Smokey Robinson up at Caesars in Lake Tahoe, and Sinatra was appearing next door at Harris. And I had worked Harris many times. Right, right. So I wandered over there to see a show, 
and I was going into the showroom when the vice president of Harris Hotel saw me, and he was talking to a big heavyset guy with a cigar, and he said, Tommy, come here, and I went over there, and he said, this is Mickey Rudin, and I recognized the name, it was Sinatra's lawyer, and he said, Mickey, this is Tom Dreesen, I think Tom would make a great opening act for Frank Sinatra, and the lawyer got a pained expression on his face like he'd heard that kind of stuff before, and he winked at the vice president, and I caught the wink. And he said, hey, kid, if I gave you a week with Frank, would you want more than uh, 50000 I said, Mr. Rudin, put it this way. If you gave me a week with Frank, would you want more than 50000 <laughs> started laughing. And he said, I like this kid. And a week later, I got a call that I want to work with Frank in Atlantic City at the Golden Nugget. And I thought, yeah, I'll go do one week, and I'll get my picture taken with him, and I'll hang at every bar back in Chicago. <laughs> what was your first response when you first you know, met him eye to eye? That must have been some feeling inside of you. I mean, yeah, well, you know, it was at rehearsal, and I, I walked up on stage, and he didn't know, but I, somebody had introduced me to him years ago, Pat Henry, his old comedian that had been with him, and he didn't remember it. But even that was, uh, I was awesome when I first met him. But at rehearsal, I went out, and the, his, at that time, his piano player was a guy named um, Joe Parnello. And Joe knew me. Joe had seen me perform with other artists, you know. Mm -hmm. and so Frank, I heard Frank say to him, who's the kid? He said, that's the comedian. He goes, oh, is he funny? And Joe said, yeah, he's really funny. I mean, but I, I was standing close by. So he turned around and he said, hi, how you doing? You know, I said, hi, Mr. Sinatra. I'm, I'm excited about being here and thank you so much for having me. He said, oh, enjoy yourself. But the, the first night, he didn't, didn't say anything. The second night, he and his wife, Barbara, took me out to dinner. And... I, in the middle of dinner, I can remember it like it was yesterday. He set his knife and fork down, and he looked at me. He said, I like your material, and I like your style. I'd like you to do a few other dates with me if you're interested. And I didn't say, let me check my calendar. I said, yeah. Of course, of course. <laughs> 15 years of 45, 50 cities a year. And, and Frankie, in the truth, in that 14 years, I turned down more sitcoms. Oh, yeah, I can comedians imagine. Comedians get offered in a lifetime. Every time the, the networks would call me in with, to do a show with an ensemble group, I knew that if I took the show, I would have to quit touring with him, staying at his house six times a year, you know, um, and palling out with him. And, and I just didn't want to do that. I, I, sometimes when I think back, and I don't regret it, but I remember an author named Christopher Morley once said, success is living the life you want. That's right, exactly. I was living the life I wanted. I mean, you, you know, I'm, I know you're a Frank Sinatra fan, to, to have him like you, I was a fan, and I was a kid hearing him on a jukebox. And, you know, my, my one-man show that I'm doing, I talk about that, that I first heard his voice when I was eight years old, shining shoes in a bar in Harvey, Illinois, and he was on the jukebox. And then, then I take the audience from that little boy hearing Frank Sinatra on a jukebox in Harvey, Illinois, to one day carrying his coffin out of a church in Beverly Hills. Yeah, I saw that picture of you uh, as one of the pallbearers. That was a sad day. That really was a sad well, day. Well, it was, but I was, I, it was a wonderful journey. He taught me so many things, and that's what I talk about in my one-man show, about what he taught me and a lot of laughs we had, and, and I wouldn't have missed that trip for the world. Now, working at the, at the comedy store, you met Mitzi for the first time, too. She, was, uh, she must have been something to uh, uphold. But you can you can tell your um, um, audience so so the audience I'm sorry about that phone ring I should have shut that off but in the background but I'll let it ring but I, I it, you can tell your audience that Mitzi is a woman that owns the comedy store on Sunset Boulevard and when I went single when the comedy team split up and you went out to the West Coast in 1975 mm -hmm. no matter where you went uh, people would say what do you do for a living you'd say I'm a stand up comedian the next question out of their mouth was Oh, yeah, you ever been on Johnny Carson? If you hadn't been on Johnny Carson in the eyes of America, you just weren't a comedian. You might want to be one, but you weren't one now in those days. Right. Now, Johnny Carson was broadcasting out of New York, and he moved his operation to California. And when he did, it was the same time Mitzi had uh, uh, gotten the comedy store from her husband, Sammy, in a divorce proceeding. And it was on Sunset Boulevard. And it just was the most exciting place to be in 1975, was at the Comedy Store. Yeah, they used to be Ciro's. It's, uh, uh, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis used to work that main room in the back, didn't they? Sure, that's where Sammy Davis was discovered, the Will Maston Trio. Uh, you know, uh, they, after the Academy Awards one night, everybody went over to Ciro's afterward, and the Will Maston Trio featuring Sammy Davis was, was um, opening for Patty <clears throat> Page. They so brought the house down that the next day Patty said, I'll open for you. And thus, the rest is history for them. But Cyril's was a famous place. Yeah. Mitzi uh, got it through a divorce. Her husband, Sammy, owned it. 
and it was and it was exciting and it was a place to be and mitchy was the queen of comedy as far as i'm concerned yeah she, oh yeah there was no other the improv wasn't in la at the time and so comedy became the rock and roll of the 70s every night at the comedy store in this in the 70s a comedian was being discovered every night you got to remember these were the shows that were putting stand-up comedians on johnny carson merv griffin mike douglas Dinah Shore, Rock Concert, uh, Midnight Special, Soul Train, American Bandstand. There was a show called The Jim Neighbors Show. There was, there was shows up in Canada that would come down and, and, and take comedians up to Canada. It was, comedy became the rock and roll of the 70s, and the comedy store was the mother load. It was where you got discovered at. Uh, David Letterman used to be an MC there. She used to tell him, she says, you're going to be an MC. You'll MC all the shows. That's how she talked, if I remember. You know what's so funny is that whenever somebody does Jay Leno or Mitzi, they always have to do the voice. You can't just say, well, Jay said to me the other day, or Mitzi told me one time. They always go, that, you know, you'll never work because it was Jay Leno. So uh, listen, uh, tell me, uh, Tommy, uh, how'd you get started in the business? You know, it's really exciting. <laughs> However, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I still think the world of her, I know she hates me because I led a band of comedians on strike in 1970. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that. That was important, though. It was important for those guys not to get screwed over like that because she was making out like a bandit in one respect. Of course, they, those guys were making it, too, through the club. But, you know, they still have to eat. You know, you just can't, you can't take everything, and I think you did the right thing. Well, there's a book called I'm Dying Up Here by William Needlesteater, and um, Jim Carrey just optioned it as a movie, but uh, it tells the whole story. I, 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 I uh, you know, I, I, the comedy show was making millions of dollars a year and paying the comedians zero. Right. The bartenders and the waiters and the waitresses and the guy who cleaned the toilets and the valet parker, but the comedian got nothing, and so... I was on the road. I was making 300000 or more a year. I was already touring all around the country with Sammy. I was doing fantastic. I came off the road one time when the comedians decided, and Jay Leno was the one who really was whining the most, uh, that they wanted to do this. They wanted to get paid. But to organize a band of comedians, as you know, Frankie, is, is like a herd of wild cattle. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had had the background in the JCs of organization, and I knew how to conduct a meeting a, a meeting, you know, uh, Robert's Rules of Order, I knew how to, and so they were so out of control after a couple of meetings that I just took control of the meetings, and the next, you know, was led to the forefront. Much to my chagrin, many times in my life, uh, because it turned into be a real ugly time, um, you know, I gave up 12 weeks of my of my career just walking that picket line and, and, and doing all the negotiating, and they finally won, but there's a lot of hardships. 18 comedians, 19, uh, 18 guys and one girl crossed the picket line, and when they did that, it prolonged the strike for eight weeks when it should have been over in 24 hours. You know? Yeah, and it was also one guy that actually killed himself next door. He jumped off the building. Yeah, because... a guy named Steve Lebetkin, a comedian who, after the strike was over, he couldn't get on, and he got despondent and depressed, and, and even though we had it in the contract, no retaliation. I don't blame anybody for that Steve was a good comedian, but uh, he just got depressed and he, he wrote a suicide note saying, my name is Steve Levetkin. I used to work at the comedy store. And he dove off the top of the building next to the comedy store, the Hyatt House, toward the comedy store, and he landed on the ramp. Oh, boy. Yeah. And at the, I tell you, for your listeners, at the end of the first year, two years in a row, somebody laid a dummy right there on that spot with a sign around its neck saying, my name is Steve Levetkin. I used to work at the comedy store. Oh, man. First year of the step two God. years in a row. Most people think it's his, his um, ex-girlfriend. I don't know who did it. Oh, but boy. It, it was kind of morbid, but they never did it again. They did it two years in a row. You know, even though the improv came in and then later on uh, uh, the Laugh Factory, uh, Mitzi's place, though, basically uh, brought out the major players as far as comedians were concerned. That, that really made it big. I mean, Sam Kennison, I think, uh, Jay Leno and Letterman and you and a whole bunch of other guys. Richard Pryor, I think, came out of there. And Gallagher used to work there. He also worked at police to play. I mean, I, 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 the, what started the strike was there was an original room where we all worked. We all tried. They called it the original room. It held about 110 people, I think. But it was a small room. We all got up and did our stuff. She bought the building next to it from um, a guy named Martin LeBeau and um, a 50s radio jack. And she, it was a big room there, like 450 people. Well, she had, like, Rodney Dangerfield. He'd come in and take the door. 
Right. At any rate, Jackie Mason would take the door, you know, the more established comics. So one night I came off the road, and I was going on at the comedy store, and I went to go in the little room, and they said, oh, no, you're in the main room. I said, I'm in the main room. And I went in the main room, and it was Jay Leno, Robin Williams, uh, Lane Boozler, David Letterman, and myself. We were, uh, the five of us around in the main room, and the place was packed. And then they were all new comedians as well as I. But uh, so afterward, Jay, Jay said, look, at, I don't get it, man. When the headliner works there, they get paid the door. We, it took five of us to fill the room, but we filled the room. Right, you should get the door. You should get the door, too. Well, that's, that started the conversation about should we get paid, you know. Right. And uh, I, was, I, I was perfectly content because I was working in Vegas, Tahoe, Reno, Atlantic City. I was fine with all that, but I wanted to, I wanted to stand by with my fellow comedians because David Letterman is my friend. Jay right. Reno is my friend. Right. Uh, Lane Booth is my friend. You know, Robin was my friend. Uh, and so... If they felt they should be paid, I wanted to stand by him. Yeah. How you, are you seeing any of your uh, <clears throat> your uh, siblings at all? Your your brothers, your sisters lately, or? Yeah, you know, I go back to Chicago. They're scattered all over. One of my sisters passed away from multiple sclerosis. Yeah. Um, my sister died from the complications thereof. I, I every year I would go back to Chicago and run twenty six miles for multiple sclerosis. I called it twenty six you, miles. You ran twenty six miles. I did it three times. Yeah. Wow, Tom, I'm impressed. <laughs> Bring all these celebrities back with me: <clears throat> Smokey Robinson, Frankie Avalon, Tony Danza, Frankie Valli. Uh, you know Tim Reed that would come back with me. Yeah. Um, Eddie Mariner. <clears throat> I'm trying to think of all the people who'd come back, and they would run like a block or two with me, or a mile, whatever they felt like running. Uh, Smokey Robinson's the only one who ran all 26 miles with me. Really? Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. That is amazing. And your brothers and sisters, they must have been proud of you when you started working as a comic. In the beginning, they probably said, you're going to be a comic. But then later on, I'm pretty sure they were proud of you when you were working with Sinatra. Yeah, you know what they, they say? Have you lost your mind? <laughs> Where I grew up, people worked in the factories. You're all blue-collar people. You worked in a factory, and you, you went to the corner tavern, and you bought a round of drinks for the boys at, on payday. And, you know, and, and when you said show business, people thought you lost your mind. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And, and so, and especially... I was married and had three kids the day I went in the business. It wasn't like, I mean, like I had to work, you know. Right, right. Tim Reed had a wife and two kids. So, you know, uh, so that's, the, you know, and, and for years I didn't make any money. I struggled and struggled and struggled. But I, I, um, I read every book you could find on positive mental attitude when I was in the service. And today I'm a motivational speaker. Aside from being a stand-up comedian, I, I get right. motivation. Is that for corporate America at universities? And for comedians, you know, um, but but uh, because I applied those principles when I was down and out, when I was sleeping in a car, I still applied those principles of, of perception. All of life is about perception. I perceived it to be a success. I visualization, whatever the mind can see and believe mm. it will achieve, was written thousands of years ago. That was another principle. The third is self-talk. The most important person you'll ever talk to is yourself. Right, right. That's important. A sense of humor. I lecture on those four subjects and, um, and in inject a lot of humor. But I use those principles to get me over the tough times. And How do you feel about the comedy today? The, uh, you know, the, the material has changed a lot. It's more autobiographical. Uh, it's gotten... Well, it's some, comedy was dirty in those days, too, in certain aspects. But it seems a lot more dirtier today and a lot more raw. And How do you feel about that? tell you a funny story. I'm coming off at the Laugh Factory when I was trying out some new material, and the two young comedians were in the other room talking about me, and I heard them. One of them said about me, he said, you know, he's old school. And the other comedian said, what do you mean old school? He said, he doesn't use the F word. And the other comedian said, he doesn't use the F word. What does he use for adjectives? <laughs> <laughs> and I stuck my head around the corner, and I said, <clears throat> adjectives. You know, I, I, there's, you know, Frankie, there's only one rule in comedy. Be funny. Yes. Only rule. I'm not... I love Richard Pryor, and I love George Carlin, and I love, I mean, they, they were friends of mine, and I love them. And I love all comics. I, mean, I never, I sound like the Will Rogers, but... No, no, you're right. I, I feel the same way. I, I, I try to enjoy as many of them as I can. Some of them I just don't understand, but I try to enjoy every aspect of what they're doing. I'll, I'll find something. I've never seen a comedian that I couldn't find something in their act. Now, there's a lot of comedians I may not like off stage, or do they like me, maybe, but... But uh, but uh, on stage, I'll always find something. I say, well, that was funny. That was clever. You know, I always try to find because I loved comedians before I was one. Yeah. I just th there's there's too many comedians today. There's just too many, and I don't think there's enough job. 
I, I know some people said there could never be enough comedians, and, and you're right. They're, they're right, but there's so many today that it's hard for them to break through. Well, the explosion, when I started in 1979, <clears throat> the explosion came when uh, cable TV finally broke out with HBO and everything, and that explosion developed and it became an eating machine. The uh, Because the comic, you know as I do, you go up there and you do... Uh, you know, a couple of sets, and those sets take a long time to develop. You just don't develop them overnight, and pretty soon you you know you you can't do the sets. You have to wait a year to get more material. So they tend to go for the the lesser comics and the lesser comics and the lesser comics, which makes it look a lot more easier to the to the novice that's watching TV, saying, "Hey, I could do that." That's a very good observation. Very good observation. Mm. You're right on the money with that. You hit the nail right on the head. The the the, when I, I remember, before I was ever a comedian, before I even thought about it, and I would see a man or a woman on stage making people laugh, you know, and I would say, wow, not anybody can do that. That's special. When I see a comic on stage, every MF and FF and, 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 and what they did with their body parts, and yeah. I, I think it might be funny, but, but anybody can do that. How do, how do you do a set? See, this was the problem in my day. How are we going to make it? The number one rule in sales is create the need. Now, right. we're in show business. That's two words, show and business. business yeah. The number one rule in sales is create the need. How do you create the need? You advertise. Well, how do you advertise? You get on television. Well, how do you get on television? You had to work clean in those days. Also, also the, the, uh, the proprietors that ran the places demanded that you work clean. It was a big deal in those days. I mean, today you go into a, in a into a bar and, and the guy says, "Say whatever hell you want. I don't give a shit. Just be, you know, just as long as the booze is being sold, I don't give a shit." But in those days, you know, you you remember what's his name? He used to wrap his finger on the Louis table. Louis Podell. Yeah, Louis Podell. He said, "You know, kid, you said you said crap. I don't like that stuff. You're not working here no more." So that kind of said, "Hey, man, I better." I better work clean. So th- you guys were basically taught that way, and that's, you know, that's... I was trained. No, yeah. you know, I, I had to write material for the Tonight Show that made Grandma and Grandpa, Mom and Dad, and the kids laugh. Right. In those days, that's who watched the show. Fifteen million people would watch that show. I, I, I did 61 appearances on the Tonight Show. I had to come up with a lot of oh, God, material, yeah. constantly doing new material that was that could make them, you know, that was straight-head material. Now, does that mean that I couldn't do a stag? I did a stag in Chicago two weeks ago. It was, a, I mean, I loved it. I enjoyed it because I, I can do that. But I just had a, I developed a wealth of material prior to that. Yeah. Well, you're considered the family, uh, a family type comedian where you can work everybody, which is a lot better, I think. When you, when you, when you open for Sammy Davis, guess who's in that audience? Kids. When you open for Dean Martin or Frank Sinatra, the family came to see you. Yeah. Them. Yeah. And and so you had to, you better have material. I mean, Frank. Uh, when I tell you, uh, one night I had a, a, a guy wasn't heckling me, but he was talking back and forth to me, talking back and forth, and somehow he said something, and I paused, and I said, and I repeated it, and then I said, no shit, and it got a huge laugh, because in, 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 in context of what I was right, doing, right. huge laugh. After the show, Frank pulled me aside. He said, Tommy, you don't, need, you don't need to work dirty like that. I mean, now, Frank wasn't a prude, but on stage, he didn't think I should say that word, right, I, right. and he's paying me. Yeah, and paying me good, so I said yes, sir. Yeah. You know, you want me to say that. <laughs> but but off the stage, we could talk however we wanted to, and then a bar or hanging out. You know, he, Frank didn't care, but he had such a respect for the audience. We wore tuxedos, Frankie, wherever we performed, except for closing night. If we were in Vegas or Atlantic City for two weeks, the last night we'd wear a suit to escape in. But every <laughs> night we wore a tuxedo, and, and and he told me, he said, Tommy, every night is a command performance. He said, if we were going to be appearing in front of the king and the queen, we'd wear tuxedos. Right. Those people that put their hard-earned dollars down to see our show, they're royalty, too. They deserve to be treated the way we treat royalty. And and, 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 he, and that's what he felt about the content of my material and stuff, you know. Yeah, those the, today the kids go in the back of Harris in a garbage can, and they pull out whatever they can, and they wear that on stage. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> I once said to Sammy Davis when I first started turning him, I was a novice, too. I said something about how should I dress. He said, I think you should dress at least as nice as those who came to see you. Exactly, yeah. Well, in those days, Vegas had a, a dinner show where you wore, you wore a suit and tie the first show. Second show, you might be a little more casual, you know, but uh, it, times have changed. Oh, yeah. Uh, but I'm still out there. I'll, I'll be doing it. Uh, I saw George Burns when he was 95 years old at Caesars in Lake Tahoe. I went to see him. 
he didn't run out to that microphone, Frankie, but when he got out there, he did a solid hour and 10 minutes. <laughs> and afterward, I went backstage, and I said, George, good choice. He said, Tommy, Tommy, I had some new jokes, and he was showing me some cards. He had some new jokes. He was so excited about two new jokes. And I'm thinking, he's 95 years old. That's what I want to do. I want to be just like that, you know. I worked with Norm Crosby about a couple of years ago, and... Uh, uh, I was with Freddie Roman and Stewie Stone, and it was me, and I think Sal Richards was in it, and uh, Norm went up last, and he was brilliant. He was just brilliant. He was so relaxed and so well-poised and sharp-looking, and, and he, he tore that audience up. He was really brilliant. But you can't, you know, the, there's something that happens to you as years of being on the stage. One day, at a certain point in your life, you realize you belong up there. Right, you realize exactly. realize you belong up there. You know, you, you take control of that area. Right. And of that space. And you're confident now. You're really confident. Because in the earlier days of your comedy career, the audience is the judge and the jury. If it doesn't go well that night, you go, oh my God, I'm not supposed to be here. You think they're the judge and the jury. Right. You become a veteran and you know this stuff works. It, be, it comes to the point where you get on stage and, and you say to yourself, I'm here and I'm here to, to make them enjoy themselves. And they sense that. They're like sharks. They sense that. And they sense the comf comfortability of it all. And that's what was, that brings you on to your next level. No question about it. You know, it, it, I, I teach young comics. I'll say, remember, it's conversation, not presentation. You have to act like your wife said, hey, Frankie, I got, we got a ton of people in the living room. I don't have dinner ready yet. Do me a favor. Go out and tell them some of your stories about when you were growing up or what happened last week at the, at the mall. And then you go out there, and you're, and you're in your living room. Right. Tell the young comics, put that frame of mind. You're not walking out in Caesar's Palace into their house. They're in our house. Exactly. Our house. Exactly. This is my stage, and I earned every single board on that stage, and you can't take that from me. And so you start to enjoy yourself and relax and, and not worry about Only when you worry about the consequences, go out and, and let it fly. Let it happen. And, um, and, 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 and the other bottom line is have fun. And the audience has fun. Yeah, almost every interview I've had with most of the comics on this show, they've all said what you just said, have fun. The ones that are, are pros are saying have fun, and that is it. It, it, it's, it is fun. It is a lot of fun. That's why you, it's a drug, and that's why we love to do it. And that's why I love having you on the show, and I appreciate you coming on this show and spilling your guts out here about, about your life and Frank's life and how you feel about you know the world as it is in comedy, and I appreciate that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to do it. You know, I, 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 do, I give a seminar to young comedians called The Joy of Stand-Up Comedy and How to Get There, and I don't charge them anything because 85% of all stand-up comedians are insecure, neurotic, sometimes psychotic, love-starved wrecks, and the other 15% are gifted, confident people who say, this is what I do. I know how to write a joke, and now I how to tell one. Uh, but I want them to enjoy this journey, this incredibly special gift you have. You can make people laugh. Do you know you're in less than one millionth of one percent of the population of the world that you can go on a stage and make people laugh? And because you can make them laugh, they're going to feel better, not only psychologically, but physiologically, that the brain releases endorphins into the bloodstream after you have a hearty laugh. All of this mm -hmm. is scientific evidence. And you, uh, uh, you can do this. You are a special human being. I want you to enjoy this journey. Right, and when you get out on that stage and there's 10,000 people out there and you tell, you do a joke and you've got to count three, four, five because you've got to wait for that wave of laughter to come back to you, it's exhilarating. Uh, it, it's like, notice I, about stand-up <clears throat> comedy, it's the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's not, no describing it, and when it doesn't work, there's no describing that. But, it, it, but most of my comedian friends really aren't happy and they don't enjoy the journey while they make others happy. They don't enjoy the journey. And if you're an insecure, love-starved, neurotic wreck when you're poor and unknown, yeah. rich and famous, it doesn't get better, you know. It gets worse. Yeah, that's when the drugs the come famous in. famous was going to take all that angst away. Yeah, they take the drugs. They try everything. they they got to have that big glass of wine before they go on stage. Uh, I've seen it a thousand yeah, times. Yeah, if you, need, if you need chemicals to get you out there, then you're really not in the right profession if it takes chemistry. Yeah. But in the end, in the end, it will destroy you. You know, yeah. you got to enjoy this journey. It's a, it's a great journey. It's a wonderful yeah. profession and a wonderful life. You know, but enjoy the journey. And, 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 you know, and there are ups and downs. The one advice that I give most comedians that, that s seems to stick the most is 
that I tell them that the problem with most comedians is you start to compare yourself with another comedian, specifically one that you started out with, and you'll say, gee, Frankie's doing this now, or Tom's doing that, and we started out at the same time, and he got to be on this show, and, I, and you start panicking, you know, because you compared yourself right, to the comedian. Right. There's a great Hindu proverb, there's nothing noble about being superior to another man. True nobility lies in being superior to your former self. Right. Am I a better friend than I was last year? Am I a better son than I was last year? Am I a better father than I was last year? Am right. I a better comedian than I was last year? Well, I certainly think you are, and I appreciate you coming on this show, Tom. You, you know, you did 35 minutes. You, we thought we were only going to do a few minutes, but you did 35 minutes tonight. Can I do another hour? And yes, I want you to come back. <laughs> and when I get more and more people on the show, I definitely want you to come back. Thank and, you. And yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do it. I appreciate it. Anytime you want, you know how to get home. And uh, I know you're having a great life, and I, and I want more for you, and you're the best. Thanks so much, Tom. Thank you, Frankie. I All appreciate right. it. Take care.